Anglican. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 447. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's Wednesday the 17th of October, 2018. Three, two, one. Gavin, welcome back to the program. Now, you are a man of many titles. You were once chaplain to the queen. You were a canon theologian. Obviously, you're a bishop. You were in the Church of England. Um, you're, you're famous. Uh, amazing. However, I was listening to a uh, program uh, in England the other day, and you now have a new title. The title is The Bishop Who Brought Down uh, the Downfall of the Western Church. And I, I just, you know, another applause for you. I, I'm not even worthy to have you on the program. Wow. How did you get this title? Kevin, I've been accused of many things um, by people, but this was about the most ambitious accusation that's been leveled at me so far. And it came from a presenter on a radio program called LBC, which is a London... Uh, London Public Radio, and um, mm -hmm. uh, they had they had phoned me up. I was in Croatia at the time, taking tea with my Croatian hosts uh, while we were celebrating this uh, um, attempt to uh, refurnish Orthodox Anglicanism in Europe. And they said, "Would you like to talk about the Ashes Bakery case?" These are the bakers who refused to bake a mm -hmm. pro-gay wedding slogan on their cake, mm -hmm. and. Uh, at the cost of, of uh, nearly half a million dollars, they were finally cleared of thought crime, hate crime, homophobia by the Supreme Court. So I, I, I said I'd happily talk about it. And I thought the conversation was going pretty well um, because they are the, the presenter described himself as a, as a non-practicing Christian. And um, I said my, my real complaint was that Christians were being moved out of the public space. And this was about freedom of speech and then he asked me about the uh, gay adoption and i i said <gasps> you're uh, being set up <laughs> i knew i was being set up so i tried very carefully however in the end i uh, he pushed me and pushed me into a corner and <clears throat> one of the things i said to him was well as, as it happened one of the problems we faced was that lesbian relationships were um, uh, considerably more prone to violence and instability than any other kind of human coupling uh, nice though lesbians are um i mean one one of the nice reasons for this is they demand a higher standard of emotional intelligence from each other and uh, they they so the, the bar is often set quite high for a good relationship and and, um, and and fails sometimes however he was so incensed by this i i explained to him that this came from 30 years of research in scandinavia and um even the bbc had had uh Acknowledged that gay relationships were more violent than straight ones and exponentially uh, and lesbian ones, particular. Anyway, he 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 burst out into fury and said uh, he was embarrassed to have these bigoted views on his program and and he said, you know, no wonder he'd begun by saying, you do realise that under twenty there are as many Muslims as there are Christians in the UK. And I said, well, yeah, that's you know, if you have the immigration policy that we've had recently, that might well happen. But he said, you you know, your views. Not that these are my views. These are Scandinavian statistics. Your views are, are single-handedly responsible for destroying Christianity in this country. And um, <laughs> I thought he was crediting me with too much. Yeah, uh, yeah because uh, yesterday was the uh, anniversary uh, or the, the, the celebration, if you want to call it that, of uh, Vladimir and Ridley's martyrdom uh, where they were burned at the stake. And I thought, you know, this is a great time to have uh, this type of topic and juxtapose that against what's happening today in England uh, by, by well, the University of Oxford. I don't know if you read today, but uh, they're going to have a uh, person who believes he's a Muslim, uh, believes in Islam, uh, give the Eucharistic uh, uh, preaching at a service at the University of Oxford. Have you heard this? Yes, his name is Imam Monawa Hussein. Uh, he's a doctor okay. of letters. He's a very, he's a very clever man. He, he's a nice man. There is a large Islamic center in Oxford that's been founded by the funded by the Saudi Arabians for some time. Um, there's been a fuss in Oxford over the last few years as the <clears throat> uh, mosques have wanted to compete with the bells by amplifying the called prayer from the minarets and. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, this has been a sign of the cultural change. One of the cultural changes we didn't expect was the University Church, which was the very site where, La where Ridley, Latimer and Cranmer were accused of heresy, and then where they were burnt alive. Um, at this very site, the University Church has asked this particular imam to preach, n not just to preach, but to preach in celebration what's called the Eucharistic Sermon. Um, you probably couldn't have a more symbolic heart of uh, Christian faith <laughs> than this church in this city uh, and for this announcement to be made uh, within hours of our remembering Ridley and Latimer's supreme sacrifice for their love of Christ, for their devotion to the Word of God, for their determination to pay any price required of them to keep, his mem keep faith with his memory, for the Church of England, the University Church, and even the University of Oxford, to um, to, to 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 promote this is stretches even my mind to the edges of its elasticity. Yeah, it, it, it's unfathomable, um, and obviously the, the the quote about the, the the candle keeping the light on in England. Uh, hopefully our death will uh, light this candle and keep it going on in England, you know, forever. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. Um, I see the Church of England trying to distinguish, uh, extinguish this candle uh, time and time again. Uh, and I, I see once in a while a small voice from the wilderness, a remnant left in the Church of England saying, oh, wait, you can't do that. Uh, apparently there's a, a conference going on called the Living Love and Faith Conference to discuss the document uh, to be released in 2020 about what the church is going to do doctrinally and liturgically about marriage, same-sex relationships, and blessings. And the several evangelical bishops came away from this uh, meeting, uh, looks terrified if you read this letter. And I thought I'd get you to kind of summarize the letter. In typical English style, it's a long letter with very small points and if you could help us out um first let's let's talk about who wrote the letter and uh help uh, translate the english for us gavin right um uh, uh, i earlier on i had my notes e exactly in, to have the signatures so i'm just going to have to press a button and hope that here we are the letter arrives there it is and at the bottom this the technology is absolutely wonderful the authors oh, yeah. of the letter were the, were the following bishops carlisle shrewsbury durham ludlow birkenhead wilsden peterborough plymouth blackburn maidstone and lancaster lancaster uh, is the one woman bishop there and she's been recently appointed and i think this shows uh, I'm going to be critical of the authors and of the letter, so I'd like to say I think in her case this shows great courage and, and, and good for her. I'm not going to be quite so generous to the other authors in a minute. Okay, well there was a, a group started uh, by uh, John Stott, an evangelical group, and many of these uh, are writing under the letterhead of this group. And I thought, you know, it's interesting. There are still evangelicals, there are still Orthodox people still within the uh, Church of England. Um, and you don't hear from them very often. And you don't hear from them at the important points in, in the church, uh, especially over the last 20 years. Now, finally, uh, they put together a letter uh, that shows their fear about the process and what's going to happen to them um, if this goes through. Can you help summarize? Kevin, Kevin, it is really extraordinary. Um, the silence from the House of Bishops over any number of issues, I mean, including, for example, um, the Ashes Bakery case, which although it took place in Northern Ireland, is still part of Great Britain, and they had to go to the Supreme Court in London. It's an English as issue as you can like, uh, as you like. Um, and not a, not a single Church of England bishop celebrated the triumph for the freedom of speech and 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 the huge relief for these wonderful christian couple they were completely silent they've been silent at pretty well every public juncture in the last five years but they as you say they've spoken up um what have they written well the letter uh, can, is, can um, I, can, can, let, let me interrupt here canon or bishop kiernan from the church of ireland 
who I would say has not always been a friend to the Orthodox, actually put out a statement uh, uh, congratulating them. And I was very I impressed by that. Uh, as, on behalf of Anglican TV, we thank him for doing that and for uh, bringing this to light uh, for the people in Ireland. And uh, um, thank you for being the Northern, only bishop. Northern Ireland. Nor I'm sorry. Northern Ireland, Kevin. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's right. Not, not Southern Ireland. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to cause another <laughs> conflict. Um, so I, I do want to thank uh, Bishop Kiernan, who, who, who he and I have not always been the best of friends, and I, I, I want to thank him for that. So, so credit where it's due. Bravo. Credit where it's due, yep. What I'd like the, to do, Kevin, the letter. Is, this letter is, uh, is five pages long. Uh, I had to read it three times. Um, the first time to get a sense of it, the second time because I didn't think it made any sense. The third time looking for the bits that made sense to make sure I hadn't missed them. Uh, and then I decided the best thing to do would be to translate it because it, we, you know, we'd be here till tomorrow if I read it out loud. So I, what I've done is translate it from English to English, from, from a particular kind of English to, I suppose, what we call red top or, or, or journalist English. Yes. Uh, so here is, I, and there are 10 paragraphs. And the really interesting thing is that in nine of them, almost nothing is said. But in the 10th one, right at the end, at the climax, uh, that, that's where, the, that's where the, the, the really hard stuff is. So the first paragraph, is it is about 20 30 lines and it's saying hey let's share perspectives together it's written to the chairman of the live in love and faith document i should say again that the word love here doesn't mean agape it's eros, no. eros so this yeah. is a, this is going to be a document about erotic love and um what kind of faith that's another matter so the first paragraph says hey um dear bishop of coventry who's a chairman we want to share our perspective with you great the second paragraph says, in case you hadn't noticed, we're wrestling with this, and in our experience, it's complex. 30 lines, but that's what it comes down to. The third paragraph, they move on inexorably with a devastating logic and say, by the way, this affects us and it matters, so please keep reading. <laughs> the fourth paragraph say, it breaks new ground, and it says, it's our perception that everyone is worried about sex and gender. And then there's an element of panic. It even made GAFCON in Jerusalem happen this year. So that gives you a sense of the earthquake that we're living through culturally. Sure. Uh, the fifth paragraph then says, it's come to our notice that some people in General Synod have rejected biblical teaching altogether. So you're, Now, hold on. Well, they just noticed this. Is this something brand new they just noticed? They, well, it, it's come to our attention. They don't say when they noticed it, but, but okay. they've noticed it. And, and then, but, and then um, so Kevin, humility is one thing. Um, lack of confidence in the scriptures is another. And they, 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 they confuse the two because they then go on and say, we're not awfully sure about our own reading of scriptures. So we've gone back to check just in case we were wrong. Uh, this pays no attention to 2,000 years of, of tradition and, and, and holiness, but, but they were panicked. So they, they, but they reassure us and say they've gone back to read the scriptures again. Uh, the, the sixth paragraph says, um, we expect that this new document is going to map out new arguments. And when it does that, we like it very much if you didn't leave scripture out of it completely. Um, having said that, um, Chapter paragraph seven then extends the argument again and says living in love and faith is going to affect gay people, but it'll affect us. Now, bear in mind, we all have a shared humanity. At this point, they say something uh, uniquely insightful in the document because there's not a great deal that's insightful. But at this point, they, they, they reach towards insight and they say a shared humanity ought to mean a shared ethic. This is very interesting because what they're trying to do by virtue of this argument is to box in their critics with the force of logic. So they then go on to say what this shared ethic ought to be. And they, they say in uh, paragraph eight, we think it ought to be the Lambeth resolution, the one that annoys the progressives so much, uh, a pure and chaste life before and after marriage. But just in case scripture doesn't work for you. Well, Lambeth that's, from, that's from Lambeth 1920. That's not the 1998 one. You go way no, that's back 1920. That yeah. That's true. No, they only go to 1920. 
so they, 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 they so they've looked at scripture with not as much confidence as I'd like them to have. They go to Lambeth 1920. Well, that's a good move. And then I'm not sure who they think they're talking to, but the, the summit of their argument is if scripture and 1920 aren't good enough to you, may we draw your attention to Canon B30. I look forward to Orthodox Christians um, parading round General Synod with little signs saying, don't forget Canon B30. That'll, that'll clinch any argument going. And, th and then they ought to say, by the way, if you accept what we're saying, the conclusion would be we could all get along. Um, they have a phrase called living in unity with truth. I don't think they know what unity means, and I'm afraid I think truth is a consistent concept here. But let's pass on, because number nine is where it happens. They are barking, Kevin. The evangelical bishops of the Church of England have opened their mouth and they have roared. And so the question is, what's the bite look like? Because what if they opened their mouth and there were no teeth there, there was just a gum? Well, you judge yourself. So in paragraph nine, they say the House of Bishops promised not to change Christian ethics. And so we warn you, if you do change Christian ethics, it's going to cause us problems. Kevin, there's not even a capital P here. It's lowercase p. <laughs> and then they say, and it won't, it won't just be us. This is not just self, private self-interest. It won't just be us who experience this as problematic. And therefore, you are under a moral duty in your document to work out how we can adapt the structures that that may need may need to adapt if we are what to avoid schism to avoid to, to, to no, if we are to to continue in in good fellowship dialogue and cooperation even though we're on a totally different page and just in case they've caused gross offense in paragraph 10 they say hey by the way thank you for all your hard work kevin yeah Amen. Uh, you know, I got to tell you, um, it's so nice to know that we're going to have future problems in the Church of England if things aren't straightened <laughs> out uh, in 2020, because the, the, the last uh, uh, several hundred years have gone so well. D Gavin, this is before your time, before my time as well. Uh, I remember when the, we, the, the biggest arguments were about whether or not we could have candles on the altar or what the bishops got to wear. Um, or the clergy, for that matter, the, the, the cloaks and stuff like that. Those were the, the oh, hard sorry. issues of our time. <laughs> Over the world, there was, there was even even theological discussion about the nature of the epiclesis, the prayer for the Holy Spirit over the yes. Eucharist. Kevin, but Bonhoeffer said, um, and I'm reminded of him more and more these days, um, Bonhoeffer said, if you're on a train that's going in the wrong direction, <laughs> running backwards down the corridor isn't going to achieve very much. This train is going in the wrong direction. It's uh, and this is a kind of scuttling from corridor, from carriage three to carriage four. It isn't going to achieve very much. I, I was talking to a, a very respectable conservative evangelical theologian last night on the phone, and I was saying to him, um, uh, "This is an extraordinary situation. Why? How is it they can be so inept? So well, let's not." add them any more criticism. And he said something very interesting to me that I didn't realize. Uh, and um, he said, because there's a feeling abroad amongst the evangelical would-be traditionalist constituency, that if they pray hard enough or want hard enough or think hard enough, the authorities in the Church of England will give them a third province. And I said, but, mm. but, but that was impossible 10 years ago. I mean, yeah. in fact, what actually happened was the Anglo-Catholics, when they were uh, at the peak of their strength in the last 20 years, at the moment when the consecration of women was brought to the General Synod, sat down to have a, a very tough negotiation. And I thought that if they could have achieved a third province then, we could all stay in the Church of England. And actually that was true. But I knew already that the people who had been planning this journey, this train journey for the Church of England, and it had been planned, and they had recruited, and they had step by step gone on a long march through the institution. I knew that the people who planned it would, would do anything to avoid a third province for the Anglo-Catholics, let alone the evangelicals, because otherwise they would find themselves with a, a, a mixed economy in the Church of England uh, forever. And so although we had the help of four or five wonderful progressive members of General Synod who halted the whole thing whilst more negotiations took place, in the end the leaders of the Anglo-Catholic movement folded and they settled for the present arrangements 
uh, we won't we won't discuss those further. They will prove to be inadequate quite shortly, although they're providing a nice place for the moment. Now, the idea um, that in in a general in general synod two elections later, when the Orthodox constituency is significantly smaller than it was in two thousand and twelve, uh, that that that. The, the, there are people around going around the evangelical community saying we could be safe because the nice people pushing this agenda um, who only gently misunderstand us will give us a safe place in the church after all it is is reaches such a level of um, under-informed wishful thinking and unreality as to be frankly well, almost unbelievable so I, I didn't yeah. believe him but it's true there's no appreciation for recent history is in my humble opinion dual integrities has failed mutual flourishing has failed all those ideas that we can just work this out even though it's a really tough issue and you know work together has failed and i think you know uh for the evangelicals to put their hands up at this late date and say wait a minute there's gonna be problems if you continue to pursue uh living love and faith uh the way you're pursuing it and we don't we've not seen drafts yet i'll probably get a leak uh you know in the next month or two but uh until you know they realize it's it's a little too late in my humble opinion well we, we that that's true and and we know of course that the the strat the progressive strategy that um, uh, those in charge of the Church of England are pursuing is to change the practice of the Church of England without changing the small print, uh, or rather without changing the large print. So there won't be a redefinition of marriage. What there be will be is a a new pastoral theology that people will be invited to sign up to and to commit to in the interests of those gospel virtues our Lord, well, they were never far from our Lord's mouth: inclusion, diversity, uh, equality and tolerance. Those things that Mark and St. John endlessly write about in most of their chapters. I think that's an important point because all the other documents that have been produced, Anglican Communion wide and Church of England wide, have been able to, um, you could just hide your activity behind them. The Windsor Report just meant provinces had to hide their progressiveness a little harder. Uh, the Pillin Report meant, well, you you can still do it, but you got to hide it. We don't want to see it. We don't want to talk about it. Um, y you can have your relationships, just don't do it in public. And I think the problem here with the living, love, and faith uh, future document, what's on paper now, it's so fearful because you no, know, you don't have to hide it anymore. We, as a pastoral concern. And a pastoral response will let you do what you need to do in public because we don't want to shame you. And I Pilling think that's what the, the evangelicals pill. are responding to here. Um, well, th that's true. And of course, this has been um, a steady accretion. The Pilling Report was designed to set the foundations for that. And, and the very brave Bishop of Birkenhead was one of the people who slowed that down a little. But it's just been a matter of slowing it down. The Living Love and Faith document designed to come out in 2020 was always the next stage. And it was always intended to produce a new pastoral and therefore theological culture. And the liturgical stuff will follow. It just won't be authorized or rather it won't be forbidden. Uh, it will be seen as a sensitive liturgical response to the pastoral priorities the Church of England has developed. Kevin, the difficulty is Bonhoeffer was right. Um, you have to get off the train <laughs> if you don't like the direction the train is going in. And I'm afraid that, that I, I feel very sorry for the signatures of this letter. Friends of mine have said that um, they're proud of them because they stuck their head above the parapet. They've received a certain amount of Twitter abuse and uh, one can't underestimate what this might have cost them emotionally. But I think they're not living sure. in the real world. And if you want to know what it costs you to serve Jesus, then you need to look to Latimer and Ridley and Cranmer. And Bonhoeffer. And we need it. Um, um, certainly Bonhoeffer, <laughs> and we need a few more people to stand up for it, and we need the Church of England not to rubbish George Bell, Bonhoeffer's good friend, <laughs> who was one of the voices who stood by those who were willing to give their lives and their witness for fidelity to the gospel. The Church of England needs a new reformation, Kevin, uh, and it's over late. Ah, indeed. Um, let's finish up here. This is audience participation time. If you've watched this program and you love what we're saying and you want to continue and you want to encourage us to, to let you know that you liked it,
click the like button. It's real simple. Facebook has one, YouTube has one. If you want to comment, you want to add more information to what we've just said, there's comment sections in YouTube or on, on the Facebook feeds. We read those. Um, if you don't like the pro pro program and you want to comment, that's fine too. If you want to correct us, join the club, put a comment in. You know, it's a big uh, club to correct us. Uh, we have a podcast. You'll find those in the show notes on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe. Uh, but that's the audience participation point. And if you are really brave, not a little brave, we're talking, you know, Latimer and Ridley brave, share the program with your friends. <laughs> you know, just, just go out Kevin, there and, and yeah, share. Uh, may, I, Kevin, uh, may, I add, may I add a footnote? Because, I mean, this is unscripted, and so you don't always speak as coherently as you should have done. Uh, the thing is, the can't, I mean, God can do anything, but in human terms, there isn't going to be a reformation in the Church of England because it's in a kind of Babylonian captivity, uh, and 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 those who are running it, unless the Lord speaks in the middle of the night, may may you do so, are not are not going to give way. Uh, there needs to be a new reformed Anglicanism. I think the only hope for for biblical faithful Anglicans is to follow the example that the Americans have set us. Um, you weren't always uh, as sophisticated in the examples you set us uh, as when you threw tea overboard and wasted a very splendid drink in Boston Harbor. You have your low points too. You yeah, do. But, but, we but, now but drink Dunkin' already, Donuts coffee. That's how bad we are. <laughs> but you've been on the track. What well, this this is a global cultural struggle, and you hit the uh, you hit the lap earlier than we did. And you discovered that the only way for Anglicans to live faithfully to our Lord and the gospel was to create a new form of Anglicanism. There isn't any alternative in England. If Anglicans want to be faithful to the scriptures and to the Lord and to offer some witness against this cultural wipeout that's being brought against the church, it looks like it has to be outside the Church of England. Inside, they've closed all the doors and they've bolted them. Well, not only that, every church has its own fire extinguisher in case somebody has a candle, uh, a Latimer <laughs> and Ridley candle. Uh, it, it, it's crazy. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gary Nash, and you'll be listening to episode 447. May the Lord grant us the courage our forebears had to keep faith with him I, and some wisdom to go with it.